All right, so my, on my first project, I managed the California Library Literacy Services Program. And can I have a show of hands of all the library directors, if you have one of these programs? Yeah, we are up to 105 programs strong now, which is really exciting. Um, you know, a few years ago, the governor restored our budget that had been down to zero. Um, and since that time, he's even um, added a couple million dollars. So with that extra couple million, we've been able to bring on the additional programs. So just recently, within the last month, we brought on Orange um, Public Library. Dave, are you here? Have, hey, Dave. Um, we brought on Lassen County Library District, and I don't think Deb's here this morning. Lincoln Public Library. I don't know if Catherine's here. I don't see her. And Santa Monica. Santa Monica Public Library, and Erica is here too. So welcome. Um, they have received just a wonderful reception from our literacy community because these guys are just awesome to work with. Um, so we have our funding set now at 4.82 million, and you know Greg is always going to bat for us asking for more. So keep your fingers crossed that we'll see um, an increase um, over the next year or so. Um, always exciting things happening within literacy too. Um, we have started to plan a forum convening of sorts in late spring. Um, this is where we want to bring together literacy providers, not only from public libraries, but from outside public libraries, as well as the Department of Education, because there's so much happening um, with the Department of Ed and the consortiums. And I know some of our libraries are receiving um, adult ed block grants, which is great. We owe a funding. So we thought bringing everyone together and having a discussion, getting to know one another better would be a really great idea. So we're starting to work on that. And also I'm excited to announce too, I haven't announced this to the literacy field, but um, we are planning a literacy coordinators conference for our CLL, CLLS libraries in November of 2017, right prior to um, CLA. We haven't done this in about a decade. They are craving it, they need it. Again, there's a lot happening in the field. So um, I am really excited um, to be able to start working on that. And actually it was genius because somebody at one of our regional meetings raised their hand and said, hey Greg, we wanna do this. And he said, sure, as long as you'll chair the committee. So um, she, <laughs> that's what happens if you raise your hand. Um, so just so you know. Okay, my other project is the Get Involved Initiative. And honestly, this initiative has been around for about, um, I think we're on our seventh year. And it's starting to wind down. But even though it's starting to wind down, we're still doing some really cool things. So we have these um, regional networks and some of them are still offering some training that we're supporting. So hopefully we'll see more to come this coming year. But we also um, tried a targeted training. Um, we did three. Um, Veterans Resource Center volunteer trainings, and we did that a couple months ago um, with our um, Jackie Brinkley and Karen Boschkob, and they were very well received. Um, so we're going to do something similar for teen volunteer coordinators after the first of the year. So I put together a group, and some of them um, are your staff. These are teen librarians and teen volunteer coordinators from across the state. They're amazing. They have super high energy. It's really awesome to work with them. So I, I can't imagine what a room full of teen coordinators is going to be like. It's going to be craziness. But we're, gonna, we're planning that for the end of February. And I don't know if we've ever done something like that, but it's going to be really cool. Um, the other thing that's neat is um, together, California together with Arizona, Idaho, and Texas just received a Laura Bush 21st Century Grant to roll Get Involved out to these other states. So um, Carla Lane is coming back after the, in 2017, woo woo, to do the training um, in these other states, which is great. And even though California, we've been doing this, we are still gonna see some money from this grant. So again, we'll be able to do these targeted trainings um, and some other um, regional meetings. And um, it's also gonna help fund some of your volunteer match premium accounts, which we as a state were planning to kind of cut back on. So use your volunteer match account and um, we have this really cool program, uh, Nation, this you know, collaborative that we're working with. All right, so my other, my other role is your state data coordinator. And um, I have to start by saying this was my first year on this side of the room working with the Public Library Survey. We had a, a little bit of a rough start the first day or so because you got a whole lot of emails from the state. Um, but after that, it went well. Um, so thank you so much for all of you that I've been working with. I've been working with your staff. And I'll tell you what, um, a diligent bunch of folks who are really passionate about making sure that we have integrity 
um, in our data. So I just really appreciate it. Want to thank you. Thanks for you know kind of putting up with me through this this first year of process. Um, we not everyone's quite done yet, but we're almost done. I think within the next couple weeks we'll be wrapping up. And the number one question that I've and I've, a question I've already got is when are you going to release the data? Which I know is super important. Um, you know, back in the day, we'd have to wait like a year. So my, my goal is I wanted so much to be able to re release this data in January. I don't think that's realistic, but it's going to be released um, it, because it has to get vetted first, and that's an important process, but first quarter of 2017. So I'm pledging to you on camera that um, <clears throat> by the end of March, you're going to be able to see that data um, gone through a state library vet. So please, if you hear from me or Ira Bray um, this year with our questions, get that back to us because as soon as we can get this data um, review complete, the sooner we can release it. Um, the other thing with that that I think is exciting as far as this project is we are going to update the infographics. I know the, the Digital Data Task Force a, a couple years ago um, put together some infographics. Thank you, Jeanette and her team at Placentia. Um, but they, needed, they need an update and we want to work with the consultant to have some infographics that are a bit more flexible than what we had for you. So I can't guarantee you that these infographics are going to be ready as soon as the data is released, but they're going to be ready this spring. So that'll be another resource for you to help tell the story um, with this data that we um, are currently um, collecting. Updates to survey, I just put that on the screen because I want to let you all know that I am fully aware that we do need to modify or at least take a good hard look at the data that we're collecting at the state. Um, this year, I kind of had to jump in feet first. Um, it wasn't the year to make a lot of changes. We did make some changes last year based on feedback from the, that we received from public library directors at our last director's forum. Um, and I think some good questions were added, but you know, I'm very aware this is, it's time we take a good hard look at this survey. Um, there's a number of stakeholders involved. Um, not only you as users, but for the state library, our consultants use this as we to inform our, um, the projects that we work on. So it's going to be a big team effort. It's going to take a while, but I want you to know that um, it's some, something I'm going to start to work on. Lastly for me, um, EDGE, I know we have spent a lot of time in um, past Director's Forum talking about the EDGE initiative. Um, and I think we have about 130 some of you who over the past four years have taken an edge assessment. Um, this is one of those things where you know we have this opportunity this year. Um, for those of you who took it in the past or who have never taken it, it's a great resource for you. Um, I don't want to get preachy on it, but um, yeah, again, it's a really great tool to use. Participate and help us help you. So help me help you. I don't want to do bad imitation of Jerry Maguire, but um, <laughs> honestly, this is not a resource only for you to use. But for me, if, if all the libraries can participate and complete this, we're going to get a, snap, a statewide snapshot of library technology services. And I can use that to go to Greg and say, hey, Greg, this is, this is where our libraries need to go. This is where they want to go, because that's one of the questions. And it really is going to be able to help inform you know, some po possibly new um, initiatives. So it's very important. Um, there is going to be a CLA Edge meetup that's um, hosted by or actually provided by the Urban Libraries Council. There's going to be food there, so even if you just want a place to sit and snack, um, come and sit down. Um, I'm going to be there. They're going to be there. Some of your um, the folks that have gone through the Edge assessment are going to be there. So if you're just asking questions about it, you just have questions, not sure if it's for you, um, come in and talk to us. And more coming in 2017, I know there's been so much going on this fall. A lot of you wanted to do it, but maybe haven't been able to get it done. Um, the deadline is in two weeks, and you're like, I haven't started yet. There's no way. Well, we're going to reopen it in 2017. Um, at least for the first part of the year. You're not going to have that option to retake it at the end of June, but that's fine. You're still going to have um, a really great assessment to work from. So that is it for me. Um, my information, If um, I'm always happy to answer questions, and I'm always happy to talk about my projects because I think they're awesome. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I won't be roaming around because I need to look at my notes, so unfortunately I will be very well on camera. Um, <laughs> So uh, I am currently overseeing and monitoring four statewide projects. Um, one of them is the Public Library Staff Education Program, the California Library Collaborative Initiatives, 
uh, Networking California Library Resources, and trust me, I didn't come up with these titles. They're uh, <laughs> our longstanding um, project titles, and Technology t and for Libraries. Um, just to give you an overview of the Public Library Staff Education Program first, it is a program that uh, started in 1998-99, um, so it's been around for over a decade, and it is our uh, primary program that funds um, staff credentialed professional development. Um, through this program, staff are, uh, they can apply for reimbursement up to $5,000 in um, course fees in, in their pursuit of a master's in library and information science, or up to $3,000 in uh, to go towards their library support staff certification. And um, I took on this program in 2013, and the need for credentialed professional development still seems pretty strong. Uh, in 2013-14 and 14-15, we had 104 applicants each year. Um, in 2015-16, we had 114 applicants. And this year was uh, one of our biggest years yet. We had 137 applicants. And we were able to award um, 84 students out of it. So this is a pretty competitive program. Um, we also, in May of 2015, did an in-house evaluation and found pretty positive reviews for uh, the program. And some of the things that respondents have said is this is probably the most important scholarship slash grant system available to students in the library science field. Uh, another person said it afforded me the ability to not be stressed about money when doing my studies, and it made me feel really good about my career in libraries. Um, I felt like someone believed and supported me to get through it and become a library professional. And in the past few years, over 90% uh, of survey respondents reported that they gained new skills and knowledge to um, really help meet their community needs. And uh, most of our uh, library school students that are funded through PLSAP attend San Jose State University, um, which is a, a, the big program in California. And for this next year of the program, we are considering looking at targeting library staff who are further along in their um, master's in library science or who have uh, special language skills so that we can support these folks to help them complete their degree and also promote diversity in the workforce. Um, these are all ideas under consideration and uh, we'd love to get your feedback as well. Um, later to uh, help envision, re-envision the program. Um, so that's it for PLSCP. Uh, sorry, Greg, I know we're supposed to get rid of the acronyms. Um, the other project that I'm working on is the California Library Collaborative Initiatives. And this project has um, many components, but one of them is the maintenance and development of the Anki eBook platform. Um, this, Khalifa launched the Anki eBook platform in May of 2013, and it's, it has content purchased directly from per uh, publishers, which eliminated the role for um, the need for third-party vendors. And this is a very innovative um, platform, and we have over 80 libraries in California currently subscribed to Inky, um, which has a shared collection of over 50,000 titles. And as you may know, the California Library Services Board um, in July approved $300,000 towards um, the further development of Anki uh, as an ebook player sharing platform for California. Um, so this is very exciting news, and I uh, have been working with Khalifa on the parameters of um, how we can roll this out to libraries, and uh, I look forward to um, working closely with them so that we can um, put something out in early 2017. Uh, another um, project that uh, I um, have worked on and monitored is the technology TNT for libraries. 
And this was conceived to be a technology testing and training pilot. Um, we, pilot we piloted Wi-Fi hotspots in uh, primarily rural and underserved libraries. So this was a partnership with the Southern California Library Co Cooperative, <laughs> SCLC, um, to get Wi-Fi devices deployed to uh, these libraries. And we, through this pilot, we were able to provide 37 libraries with 143 Wi-Fi hotspots. And um, for 2016-17, we are doing a different kind of technology testing. We're looking at circulating 3D printers um, among the different library systems, um, possibly using their vans. And so you can hear more about that from um, Diane in a little bit. Uh, another um, project that I uh, work on, this one I primarily support, is our Networking California Resources. Um, this is essentially our grant that um, pays for the LSTA valuation and the uh, five-year strategic planning. So last week we had two focus groups with um, libraries and uh, I did the registration for it. Um, thank you for all the libraries who participated and who were able to send their staff to it. Um, and today, uh, as you heard, is our big uh, focus group with you all. Um, so we appreciate your time and um, presence in it today. And that's it for me. Uh, so, yes, Susan Hanks, are you? I wanted to thank everybody for making the effort to get here so early this morning. I have, I've been given five minutes, so I'm going to do this really quick. I do have business cards with me if anybody has questions or wants to email me or connect with me later. You can also find us very easily on the state library website under staff. So we're easy to find. How many new directors do we have here this morning? Okay, awesome. One of the statewide programs that we have at the State Library is California Preservation. They will help you write a disaster plan to protect your collections. If you haven't done a disaster plan, I really recommend that you go to the California Preservation website and look for training. We just completed this year's training. You can always um, contact me with any questions. And at the very least, you should update it every five years. Okay, this is really important. Who are you going to call for bug, infesta bug infestations, water damage, or smoke damage? The California Preservation Program has a 1-800 number that you can call 24-7, and somebody will answer it and connect you to resources in your community. We have a California Preservation Assessment Program, and the applications are now open. If you have, uh, if you're a small library or if you have a historic archive within your library that has preservation needs, we will help you get a professional conservationist to come in and do a building collection assessment. They will write a report. They will list all of the risk to your collection. They will list all of the mitigations, and they will tell you how much that's going to cost. And it's been very successful for the libraries that have done this to then seek additional funding to take care of the problems and protect their collections. California Light and Sound. How many people have heard of California Light and Sound? It's an awesome program that will help you digitize audio and film. The catch is we want, we want it to be California related and we want to be able to put it in the archive on the Internet Archive. Um, they have some fabulous stuff. I didn't bring the top 50 best hits. That's how many we had when we started. So they started with 50 recordings in, well, 32 actually, nominations in 2010, 50 recordings in 2011, and now we're over 7,000, all California-related audio, video, free for anybody to use. Okay, here's our partners. I'm going to quiz you on this when I'm done. <laughs> so that's all of our partners. And the contact information is there. It's on the website. Again, if you, if you have questions, please contact me. Cause, and, and I need a timekeeper. I only get five minutes. No, it's okay. Keep your time. <laughs> You're okay. So California Digital Newspaper Collection, does everybody know about this resource? It's amazing. It has a lot of our California historic resources, um, re, re, uh, newspapers in there. It has a very um, good research engine. Um, we have over 170,000 issues in that database now. Again, free, it's, it's totally free. Um, I, 
put the Browns definitions up there, but the, the database to me is, is I, I like the search function better than I do some of the commercial databases. Um, this is an article I brought up, you guys won't be able to see, but I, I searched for the state library and this one came up. But when you, when you search, it will highlight the, the search term in yellow uh, in both the newspaper copy and the OCR. One of the really cool things about this is anybody can sign up to be a volunteer and you can correct the OCR copies. So it's really good for insomnia. If you can't sleep at night, <laughs> you get in here and you get hooked and pretty soon. Um, the other thing that I've done is I've actually sponsored the um, high school juniors and seniors for their community service project. So if you're willing to supervise them from your library, you can have them correcting your local paper. If you correct the OCR, it makes it easier to search because of all those misspelled words in the early papers. This is my, one of my new initiatives. I'm working on statewide services to immigrants this year. I'm partnering with USA Learns, which is an ESL site that was developed with a million dollars in grants by the US Department of Education, the California Department of Education, the Sacramento Office of Education, and UCI, USCIS, which is United States Immigration and Citizenship Services Department of Education, Washington, DC. So they're very excited. <laughs> what we're gonna do is we're going to build um, citizenship learning modules in this. If you don't use it, it's, this site is used nationwide and also internationally. It's a very well-respected site. And they are working on building a bridge to citizenship works. So for those of you with um, services to immigrants at your libraries, the citizenship works is an online application for citizenship. And I think I did pretty close. Thank you very much. Again, I have cards. I'd be happy to give them away. And next is Janet Paul. So good morning, everyone. It's a privilege to be here today to talk with you about some of the projects and programs that I'm involved with at the State Library. And I have three that I want to cover today. Um, the first is Zip Books for Rural Libraries. And how many Zip Books libraries do we have in the audience? Yay! Woohoo! Okay, simply speaking, this project is a buy versus borrow model as an alternative to traditional interlibrary loan. It began as a pitch and idea grant in 2011, and now we're in our fourth year as a statewide LSTA project. Um, Zipbooks is a really popular service with over 95% of patrons surveyed rating it as excellent. And a recent cost benefit study um, found that for labor costs alone, the estimated cost of a Zipbooks transaction is less than $9, while a traditional ILL transaction costs between $27 and $30. And so are there are 30 libraries now participating in Zipbooks, and soon there will be more. Thanks to the California Library Services Board's recent decision to come um, to dedicate one-time LSTA funding towards an expansion of this project. And so stay tuned for more to come in the near future about the rollout of Zipbooks 2.0. And um, for, for, if, for those of you who are going to CLA, there's a Zipbooks meeting this Saturday in the Convention Center, room 201, at 2.30, um, if you'd like to hear more. The second is the Career Online High School pilot program. And this program was created in fiscal year 2015-16 with $1 million from the state. And with these funds, we contracted with Gail Sengage to provide scholarships and training to California public libraries to offer the career online high school service in their jurisdictions. How many um, COHS libraries do we have? Yay, <laughs> all right. We have 44 jurisdictions on board. And to the date, these libraries have enrolled nearly 600 students and have graduated 70, and these 70 graduates have fully accredited high school diplomas and entry-level career certificates. And given that this program really just got going in January, this is significant progress, and we're excited to see the results over the coming year. Um, we just announced a, an, an application process for our participating libraries to apply for more scholarships. And uh, for more information at Career Online High School at CLA, there's a Q&A meeting on Friday at uh, 1.30 p.m. in the Convention Center, um, room 201. And then there's a full session by the Gale reps at 2.45 in the Convention Center in room 205. And fi 
finally, I want to cover the California Revealed initiative. Um, this initiative is intended to foster digital content creation, preservation, and access statewide for California local history resources. And there are several activities under the California Revealed umbrella, um, some of which I'll mention here. Um, from the libraries that applied to participate in California Revealed last spring, we identified 10 local historical newspaper collections to fund for digitization during this fiscal year through the California Digital Newspaper Collection, which Susan mentioned earlier. And then um, California Revealed has funded a California Digital Library project to harvest some 50 existing California local history digital collections that were previously created with funding from LSTA. And these will be published in Calisphere. And because Calisphere is a digital public library of America content hub, the metadata for those collections will appear in DPLA. Um, digital storytelling. Um, California Revealed provided funding for Story Center in Berkeley to provide digital storytelling workshops at 10 locations throughout the state this past summer. Um, we have um, digital storytelling. Um, California listens participants in the audience. Yay, yay, yay. Okay, it looks like 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 most of you are, are here. Um, this project, um, which is called California Listens, collected over 120 personal stories on the California experience. And these will be featured um, in a California Stories online collection this spring. Um, another round of California Listens is being planned for this fiscal year, so stay tuned for an announcement about that soon. Um, we are funding a comprehensive crawl of the California.gov um, web domain. Um, this will be completed before the election next week. You know, it's important to do this at this point in time because we have new incumbents coming in office. There's a lot of changes to websites whenever that happens. So we're going to collect it all, and so it'll be available in perpetuity. Um, the results, um, it's a partnership with the California Digital Library and the Internet Archive. Um, the results of the crawl, it's an estimated three terabytes of content. Um, will be in the Internet Archive's web archiving service for libraries and archives, which is called Archive-It. I finally want to report about the main California Revealed activity, which is the statewide digitization project. Um, 24 libraries were selected from last spring's application process to participate in phase one, and a team of consultants worked with these libraries over the summer to create digitization plans. And moving forward, we plan to work with the California Audiovisual Preservation Program to provide digitization and consulting services for selected collections beginning later this month, actually. Um, and we'll be sending a notice out to libraries about that um, probably today or tomorrow. Um, we're planning another open application process for spring 2017. And we're also working on creating a multi-site digital asset management system to meet the repository needs of our phase one participants. And a soft launch for this repository is planned for spring 2017. And so for more about California Revealed, there'll be a session at CLA on Friday in this, in the Hyatt, this hotel um, room, uh, Region CE at 1.30 p.m. And there's also a meeting with the consultants and stakeholders following the session in the convention center, uh, room 201 at 2.45. Now obviously there's a lot more to say about all these projects, um, so please don't hesitate to ask me or contact me if you have questions about any of it. And thank you very much, and now I'd like to introduce my colleague, Natalie Cole. Okay, so good morning, and thank you, Janet. So um, today I'm gonna be talking about and giving updates on the Harwood Project, um, the broadband project, the California Center for the Book, summer reading and lunch at the library. So we're going to have some interesting segues today through these projects. So um, starting with Harwood, we're really delighted to be um, helping libraries learn about the Harwood practice and implement that practice in your communities. So the project started off with um, two in-person Harwood Public Innovators Lab, uh, one up here and one in Ontario. And um, we were really happy to train um, almost 200 members of library staff and community members in 53 library jurisdictions. And so for those of you who weren't there, um, this is how it looked. This was the start of the Ontario session. 
This is kind of midway through, everybody working really hard. And there we are, all turning outward. So I think you can see there was a lot of energy and enthusiasm around the Hallward project. So now our focus is going to be how do we translate that energy and enthusiasm that was at the lab and implement it back in libraries when everybody's back doing their whole day-to-day -day thing. So um, everyone who is at a lab has access to a series of four coaching webinars. The Northern Cohort um, are just finishing theirs up and the Southern uh, Cohort are just starting theirs. Um, we have access to um, Harwood resources online. We're developing a Harwood community of practice so that we can all help one another. And um, of course, we will be turning outward and we will be asking you about your aspirations for that community of practice because we're gonna you know, walk the walk, not just talk the talk and find out what you want. Um, but we do want everybody to be able to help one another. We'll be doing evaluation, of course, and one of the things we're going to be looking at um, in the evaluation is not just how well the tools are working, but also the support you need to be able to implement the Harwood practice in your community. So please do be candid when you see the evaluation tools come out. And then we do have in-depth coaching for 10 library jurisdictions from the Harwood Institute. So those of you who are working on this project, you should have seen the application materials go out. And they are due on November the 16th. So if you have any questions, um, please um, find me over the, you know, the conference week or Janet and let us know. And we will have an information exchange um, on Friday at 3.45 in um, the Convention Center Room 105. So we hope to see you all there. And now, onto broadband. So, you know, our big goal here is to bring high-speed broadband to all California public libraries by connecting them, not to CalRAN, obviously, but to the California Research and Education Network, <laughs> and we're not doing acronyms, and which is managed by the Corporation for Education Network Initiative in California, or you may know that by Scenic. So, um, again, we're really pleased with how this project is progressing, and I do want to give a big shout out here to our project partners, not just Scenic, but Khalifa and the Southern California Library Cooperative, because they're working really hard every day, you know, out with all the libraries, getting them connected. So by June 2018, we estimate 143 jurisdictions will be connected or in the process of connecting. Um, 275 branches will be connected by next June. And for those of you who are coming on board this year, either by connecting new branches um, or new main libraries, the Technology Improvement Grant application process opens in November. So if you have questions, let me know. Or I would actually probably direct you to Diane Satchwell, who's at the back of the room from SCLC. And she um, is managing the grant process. And we will be um, handing out a survey of connected libraries very shortly. We want to find out from you, um, you know, what is the impact of the program in your communities, on your working practices, on the programming. We want to find, we want to hear those stories and find out that information. So look out for that. And then if we are talking about impact, I want to thank Mary at Buena Park for giving us this feedback. They've only been connected since May, but I think already we can see that patrons are noticing the difference. They're, they have new programming, they have um, increased productivity. And in addition to this, Mary said, you know, prior to Scenic, our patrons were not able to watch a simple YouTube video nor participate in online training. Applying for jobs often took more time than it should, and patrons would leave the library frustrated. With Scenic, that's all changed. Recently, a patron came to the library to use a computer for an online training course and test to obtain his California food handler card. He was able to quickly complete the course without any difficulty, and he left the library with a smile and a new job. So I think we can really see here the impact that, that broadband is having you know, very quickly. And like I said, kind of interesting segues. The California Center for the quite a different project. Um, that's now a program of the California Library Association. And um, during the last year, center staff, the project staff on that project, um, took time to reflect and take stock and look at what they're doing and to make sure that what they were doing was relevant to California libraries. And what came out of that was a new advisory council, um, a focus on adult programming, and a, a slightly uh, changed mission, not just to um, help libraries promote books and reading, but also use books and reading to help libraries fulfill their potential as hubs for community and civic engagement. So what the center is doing now, um, it's still doing some special programs. It sponsored a tour by Dana Joya, um, Poet Laureate of some California libraries this summer. But it's um, mainly um, putting out three statewide programs, Book to Action, which is a book discussion author visit program that then translates into a volunteer action in the community. Read, Connect, Discover, which is kind of a library bingo game for adults where all the squares on the bingo card have um, 
have items that encourage people to read new materials, connect with new people and discover new things. And while they're doing that, not only are they benefiting from this, but then they see the library as a place for all these things to happen. And then Californians, which is a community conversation program that's been designed to complement the statewide um, focus on immigration. Oops. So what um, the center's doing is it's um, providing libraries with books and other resources, but I think one of the most important changes that it's made is that anybody who does a Center for the Book program now will get training in implementing those um, programs. So the training is on planning, outreach, and evaluation. And we're gonna be embedding some of the hardwood methods in there to make sure that the programs really are relevant to the community and they're impactful and they're what the community wants to help ensure that they are successful. And um, summer reading. So what we see here is once again, um, Summer is hugely popular in all of your libraries. Over 800,000 people signed up for summer reading. Not quite the one million that we had hoped for, but we continue to work towards that goal. Um, over 45,000 summer events and activities, and over 1.5 million people attended those events and activities, although we do know that number might decrease a little if libraries start implementing the unduplicated counts software that Suzanne will be talking about in a moment. So here is some other data that I did just want to share. And uh, you know, I do realize this is a tiny, tiny sample, but I think it's a seed from which bigger things might grow. Um, the summer reading software um, that some of you are using has the opportunity you can embed a quiz or a challenge into that software that can capture whether children doing summer reading are maintaining or increasing their reading skills. And so here we see two quite different libraries and something I found really interesting was that the libraries are quite different but the results they were getting were quite similar. And we can see that um, the kids are maintaining or increasing their reading skills on the whole. And we think the more libraries that use the software and start capturing this information, the more we're gonna have some great data to be able to go to funders and partners and show the impact of the programs. So a, a tiny sample, we can't really extrapolate from that, but we think it's a good start. And then thanks to those libraries who did the um, statewide summer reading outcomes initiative, we also know some more stories behind the numbers that you saw on the first summer slide. You know, we know that summer in California libraries is fostering communities of readers and library users, community connections, and engaging underserved community members with the library. We, we know all that. So for those of you who aren't um, doing the statewide um, outcomes initiative right now, I just want to do a really quick pitch that the survey tools are really streamlined and easy to implement during the busy summer months. The outcome statements are broad enough to be relevant to the whole variety of California libraries, but they're also specific enough to generate meaningful data. They, were, they were, came out of um, librarians in the field. And for every library that does it, we provide you with a personalized report at the end of the summer of your data with your patrons' quotes and um, survey data that you can then use to cut and paste and take it out in reports to your stakeholders. So I do encourage everyone to do this because although the numbers are great, you know, so what if we don't know the impact of what's happening? And that's what's really important to find out. So we are seeing a lot of new directions um, in libraries around summer. Um, you know, I think reflecting the increased attention that summer learning loss is getting, we're seeing um, more summer learning rather than reading programs. Um, a lot of creativity and process-based learning, online summer reading, a lot more focus on community-based activities, maybe a little less on the reading. So to reflect um, those changes, to support and propel those changes really. The statewide program is also changing. You've seen here a new name. It used to be the California Summer Reading Challenge. It's now Summer at Your Library, Explore, Learn, Read, Connect. Because we felt that really this embraced what was happening out um, in the libraries better than a, a project title that just referred uh, to reading. Again, we're gonna be developing a community of practice for this project too. We already have a fledgling community, we think. We're gonna be growing that. And also developing more programming models that can be tested and then put out there for replication. Lunch at the library is one of those. This year we'll be working with housing authorities to look at how partnerships between libraries and housing authorities can engage more kids and families with summer reading. And we'll be working with the Center for Childhood Creativity to develop a curriculum around summer that looks at process-based learning and creativity. We'll be pushing evaluation out there. And we'll also be rolling out the quality principles. We did a bit of a soft launch last year. We're going to be pushing those out this year. And those have been developed by California librarians, for California librarians, to help us all achieve project outcomes, um, whether they're the statewide outcomes or your own outcomes, um, communicate desired goals and impact to stakeholders, and to demonstrate strategies for maintaining quality programs. 
And talking about quality programs, um, I am just going to um, give some highlights from the lunch at the library program. Thank you. Yeah. So 2016, we can see the project continues to just grow and grow. Over 200,000 lunches were served, over 60,000 snacks um, at over 139 sites. So the, the program is um, really growing. It is um, a program coordinated by the California Library Association and California Summer Meal Coalition, which is a great partnership. So, um, I mean, I could talk all morning about the benefits of this program, but to keep it brief, we have, um, you know, benefits for the families, the communities and libraries. So kids are getting regularly scheduled meals during the summer. They have access to learning opportunities, positive role models, safe spaces, welcoming spaces. Um, teens are getting volunteer opportunities because a lot of the programs are staffed by teens who are then um, obtaining workforce readiness skills. We're seeing new families in the library as a result of these programs, and then those families are being connected with library resources. And we're seeing a lot of really great community partnerships. And just one to highlight here is the partnership that a lot of libraries have with Vision to Learn, which is a nonprofit organization that brings out mobile eye clinics. Um, and their vans don't really get used very much during the summer because they do a lot of work during the school year. So they've created partnerships with public libraries. They take the vans out, they do eye tests, and then they come back and provide glasses to the kids who are in the lunch program. So that's just one example of you know, a great community partnership around this program. So I do want to say that California really, really needs more summer meal sites in general. Um, it needs more sites that are popular with families and more sites that offer programming with the meal service because a lot of the kids who aren't getting meals aren't also accessing learning opportunities <coughs> during the summer. And so obviously libraries can provide all of that. Um, only one in five children who receive free or reduced priced uh, school lunches go on to access uh, meals during the summer. And in fact, um, I think it's 19% of the families we survey at the uh, lunch at the library sites tell us they don't eat lunch anywhere else but the library during the summer. Mm -hmm. So I really wanted to um, let you know that 800 libraries um, branches and main libraries are eligible to become summer meal sites and um, the more sites we have the more kids are being fed and you know connected with learning opportunities and also the more federal funds come to the state of California because the cost of the meals is all reimbursed by USDA so if you're on the fence I just want to say you can do this it is really doable and um, we've seen it in the tiniest of libraries with kids on blankets in the stacks eating you know it can be you know you don't have to have a big community room it can work in a variety of spaces so please um, find me um, over the weekend or Trish Garone or Patrice Chamberlain from the California Summer Meal Coalition and I will be in the exhibit hall on Friday lunchtime um, to answer any questions and um, I think that's me. So if you have any questions, just find me um, some other time or during the Q&A session. Thank you. And now I'm going to introduce my colleague, Suzanne Flint. As many of you know, I am the um, library programs consultant responsible for the Early Learning with Families, another acronym, ELF, statewide initiative. Um, currently, we have 135 library systems across the state that are participating in some capacity um, in ELF. And what you may not know is that the focus of the ELF initiative each year is determined not by me, but by the field and all of you. Formally and informally through surveys, interviews, site visits with you and your staff, we work to identify the best ways for the state library to both support and further the good work your libraries are already doing in serving this particular demographic. And so building on last year's achievements, coupled with this feedback from the field, the focus for 2016-17 for the ELF initiative is threefold. First, the touch points in libraries professional development training, which was adapted in collaboration with the Brazelton Touch Point Center at Harvard to develop a training curriculum for staff to help them deepen their understanding about early childhood development, as well as effective strategies for family engagement. And we'll be delivering this training now through 11 trainings to 24 library systems throughout the state in the coming year. Then, in partnership with the Center for Childhood Creativity, we're undertaking a school readiness pilot project with six libraries from around the state who are going to identify best practices for supporting evidence-based school readiness programming specifically designed for delivery in libraries. Um, and 
we're work as I say, the Center for Childhood Creativity is a think tank. They've been reviewing 30 years of research around um, school readiness, and are, we're all been sort of surprised to learn that some of the things that we used to think about preparing kids for school, actually that's really not the best way to prepare them from school. So um, we, at the conclusion of the pilot, at the end of the year, we'll create a toolkit that will be available for statewide dissemination for any of the rest of you who then want to take what we've learned and implement it in your own way in your own libraries. And finally, we're finishing up the Unduplicated Counts open source software project that was initially developed by El Dorado County Library. I don't know if Jeannie's in the room. Um, and we're, gonna, we're currently preparing a toolkit, again, to share this software with any interested library. And um, it's a little bit of the wild, wild west. Um, we have created, it's been professionally created. It'll be available for minimal cost and open source. But then we're looking to all of you to help us continue to learn about its specific adaptation in your library systems. It's essentially a template for very customizable um, collection of user data, but also the ability to slice and dice that um, user data in very unique ways. And Natalie referred to, you know, even some of the summer reading programs are beginning to explore one of the particular applications of the software, which is to begin to gather unduplicated counts. Um, currently, most libraries do not gather that as a statistic, partly because it's very hard to do. And until we, this software was developed, it was a very challenging statistic to get our arms around. And what an unduplicated count is, it's basically tracking unique users versus total visits. And interestingly enough, it's a statistic that's actually really critical to many other funders. Matter of fact, some funders won't even talk to you unless you can provide unduplicated counts. So we still have a lot to learn about this, but we're really excited for working with those of you as we you know, share the software to figure out together, you know, is this working? Is this the best way for us to capture that data without having to violate any sort of confidentiality issues? So it's an exciting sort of frontier that we're in in the middle right now. Then um, this year, we also published an ELF impact report this past year. And I have to say, it was an incredibly powerful experience. We got feedback from all of the libraries that have been participating in ELF, from their staff, from their users. We looked at their use statistics. And I have to say, there is truly a sea change that has taken place in the way public libraries are being perceived, especially in their early learning role. And you know, although ELF certainly has been working hard to support that perception in, and that, those changes and that per, change in perception, the kudos really go to all of you who as directors have made early learning an essential library service and priority and have committed time and resources to its quality provision. And kudos also go to, I am I'm so honored to work with staff, I'm going to cry here because truly so many of you have quite remarkable dedicated staff who have worked really hard to evolve services, learn more about children and families, innovate and advocate whenever it comes to making sure that we are serving this particular population of young children and families well. So I can't thank all of you enough because we may have lofty ideas in Sacramento, but you're implementing them and we're learning from you and then helping to spread them to yet more libraries. So our ELF impact report, coupled with other user statistics, revealed some very impressive results from our collective efforts. Efforts. In fact, it turns out public libraries in California are now second only to public parks as the most frequented destination by families with, with young children. And this is a fact not lost on many other early childhood stakeholders. And it is especially noteworthy when you consider it wasn't that long ago that this particular demographic wasn't particularly welcomed in libraries, let alone actively sought out and encouraged to come. So you've done phenomenal work in creating that sea change. And so how has this phenomenal change in services to young children occurred? Well, it started with all of you first, changing your library spaces for this demographic reconfiguring space to include comfortable seating for both adults and children, space for nursing mothers, colorful rugs for infants to crawl on, adding changing tables to your restrooms, um, providing space for stroller parking, and toys to engage little ones. Second, services have been changing and evolving. 
and we've been working really hard to help you all base those changes in service on the latest research regarding child development, family engagement, school readiness, play, and creativity. Plus, the ability of libraries to serve as significant, informal, significant and impactful early, informal early learning environments has now been acknowledged by others. And so consequently, um, other community stakeholders are beginning to really acknowledge and value the role that libraries have and are reaching out to many libraries, with, rather than us always going and knocking on their door, in terms of, especially if they want to ensure that they've got a community-wide approach to early learning. And perhaps one of, you know, the current frontier that we're working on this year and most of, one of the most significant evolutions taking place in, the, in this dynamic, dynamically changing libraries is to helping libraries go beyond just including parents in children's service to pursuing a deeper understanding of what it means to truly support parents as, their, as the experts of their own children. So for many libraries, this has meant moving from teaching parents about early literacy and learning and scaffolding parents in their own early literacy and learning efforts. And of course, in order to effectively implement any or all of these changes, staff skills are changing and evolving. And staff deserve high quality, relevant, professional development that can help them to effectively navigate these changing dynamics. All three aspects of this year's ELF initiative are designed to support and further the progress we've made to date while continuing to prepare libraries for yet new early learning challenges to come. We invite any of you who want to join us tomorrow evening from 4 to 6 p.m. We'll be across the Capitol Mall Park at the Westminster Presbyterian um, Church. We'll have food, um, <laughs> but you can also come and hang out, talk to me, talk to lots of other people who have been involved and will be involved in this next year going forward. So in closing, um, I'd like to share with you a Paula Poundstone <coughs> quote. You may already be familiar with it, but I believe it's worth repeating several times a day, matter of fact. And I'm going to read it to you, even though I know you all can read. Um, it's funny that we think of libraries as quiet, demure places where we are shushed by dusty, bun-balancing, bespeckled women. The truth is, libraries are raucous clubhouses for free speech, controversy, and community. Librarians have stood up to the Patriot Act, sat down with noisy toddlers, and reached out to illiterate adults. Libraries can never be shushed. So. I just, I just want to thank, I want to thank all of you for everything you do each and every day to make sure that libraries are never shushed, and instead to be really effectively working at catching the next generation of library users in the cradle, and helping them fall in their lo fall in love for life, with their local libraries, however they may look in the future. Thanks. <laughs>